Hey everyone, this is Matt with Motion VFX, and before we get started with this video, I just want to say thank you for all of the positive feedback we've received on the previous Five Nodes video, uh, which by the way, if you haven't seen that, you can click up here in the corner, but your kind words of encouragement have motivated me to produce another video kind of like that. Also, stick around to the end of this video, we've got a special announcement to make, um, but you know, this video is going to be another Five Nodes type of video, and I promise you, you already know about some of these nodes, but kind of along my philosophy, I don't think it's necessarily about learning every single tool and learning what they do, but rather learning and discovering new ways to use the tools that you're already familiar with. And I think that's really going to push your creativity, your problem solving, and your overall skill set um, to that next level. So <laughs> for example, this first node, I'm not even kidding, the background node. Now I know what you're thinking, like Matt, uh, everybody knows about the background node. It, it basically just makes a color or some kind of a gradient. There's even a four corner option if you want four colors like this. The gradient option has a little bit more control over the kind of gradient that you want to create. And you can, of course, add other colors inside of this gradient bar right here. Now most people already know about the background node, but I want to share a really fun motion graphics technique that's all driven by this very simple background node. So I'm going to reset this and just leave it at the default gradient for now. So what I want to do is grab the 3D text node. And anytime you're working with 3D, you need to eventually render them out using the render 3D. So let's go ahead and connect these up. And now we can connect this to media out. And let's just type in some text here. And I'm going to set my vertical anchor to zero just to center this. And let's maybe choose a different font. And I'll go ahead and resize this down. Now, if I come down to the extrusion tab, you can see we've got this bevel depth and bevel width control. So the bevel depth is basically like the angle of the bevel. We don't really need a steep angle. Something like 0 0.0001 will work. We just need some bevel. And then for the bevel width, I'm just going to increase this to about 0 0.006. And under the shading tab, I'm going to uncheck use one material. This gives me separate control over the front face material and the bevel material. So what I want to do with my background is actually set my bevel of my text to image. And this gives me a new bevel texture input. So I can feed my background directly into that green input like this. And let's actually set our text to black for now. And you can kind of see we've got this really cool traced around the edges effect. And if we go into our background, we can manipulate the gradient. So with this first color here, I'm just going to drop the alpha all the way to zero creating a fully transparent color. And then I'm going to tighten this up by dragging the second color in a little bit like this to create this very sharp gradient. And now using this offset slider, I can kind of trace the edges of my text on like this. So let's go to the very beginning of the timeline and I'm going to roll my offset all the way past one so that we're starting with a completely invisible bevel. And I'm going to add a keyframe here and maybe go forward to about frame 55 and we're going to roll this offset a little bit past zero so that our bevel fully connects. Now for the main color of the text, let me go into the text 3D and I'm going to set this to white and change this to image as well. This gives me another input which we can use another background straight into that color image input like this. So in the second background, we're going to switch this to a gradient as well. And similar to the other gradient, I'm going to start with a fully transparent color and the second color is going to be kind of like a dark blue. Now, right now, you can see that gradient is being mapped to every letter individually. That's not something I typically like, so I'm going to go into the text 3D and switch the mapping level to word. And now we get this gradient applied across the entire word. And let's view this gradient over here. And you can see if I roll this offset, we can kind of fade on that blue color. So I'm going to go a little bit before the stroke finishes its journey. And we're going to roll this offset right here and add a keyframe and then pull a little bit forward and then drop the offset again so that our text is fully opaque. Now it's probably a good time to rename these backgrounds. So I'm going to select them and hit F2. OK, so now what I want to do is push this a little bit further and use the background node once again. This time I'm going to put this out here in an empty space and we can actually feed the output from our render node straight into the blue mask input. And if we view this background over here in the left viewer, you can see that it's just going to create a black silhouette of our alpha channel. But if we go over here to the settings tab, we can choose the channel that it uses to create the mask. So if I change this to luminance and drag my low threshold up a little bit, you can see that we can 
isolate just that stroke and do something separate with this, like give it its own color. And we're kind of leveraging the power of nodes rather than creating a couple of duplicates just to be able to do something separate with them. So what I might want to do after this background is add the rays effect. And let's go ahead and merge this over our render node. And now you can see we've got these nice rays, which really goes well with this kind of stroke outline effect. And in my rays, I might want to drop the threshold, mess around with the decay, the weight, and the exposure. Let's also add a couple of glow effects after the rays. So I'm going to add a soft glow here and let's increase the gain and decrease the glow size. And I can also go down to my color scale and maybe add a little bit more red. And let's copy and paste that glow. This time we're going to reduce the gain and increase the glow size a little bit and also add more red and maybe even take away some of the green. So it's going to get a little bit more purple and let's move these up a little bit like that and let's copy and paste one more soft glow. This time we're going to increase the glow size even more and reduce the gain a bit like this and we can add more red, take away more green. So now we have this exponential glow. And to add a little bit more fun, we could even go to this background here. And let me actually copy this color right here because I'm going to switch this to a gradient, but I still want to use that same color. So I'm just going to paste that into this second color like this. And if I click on this second triangle, we can make something kind of like a gradient that goes from like a blue, maybe even kind of a dark purple to that gold color. And if I grab these control points and cinch them closer together like this, then come over here to repeat and switch this to ping pong. Now my offset kind of cycles through those colors or we can even go to fully transparent again. So that way we're kind of creating this like shining glistening effect where sometimes there's no rays at all. I think what I'm going to do though is actually go for something kind of a lightish blue and maybe leave the alpha all the way to zero. So that way the white stroke, which is being generated right outside of this render node here, isn't being overshadowed by another color. So let's go to the beginning here and I'm going to add a keyframe for my offset once again. And this time I'm just going to go pretty far into the future like this and just let this cycle through. Here's what that looks like. Now something else I could do is keyframe this gradient so that it starts to fade out towards the end of the comp and I can go ahead and relabel this background as well. So again, we're just using these three background nodes to create everything that's going on. Without all these backgrounds, we pretty much just have our text. <laughs> so it's kind of crazy what a simple background node can do. We can even add a transform after this bevel. So I'm just going to drop a transform right here and I can use my X position to offset the stroke here and I can even switch edges to wrap. And this will kind of infinitely wrap around like this. You could also reduce the size. So for example, if you do 0.5, then every edge will get two copies of that stroke. And maybe we can also create a little bit of an animation that goes in the opposite direction of the stroke. So I'm going to go to the very beginning again, and let's just create a keyframe on our position for this transform. And we're going to go to the point where this background completes its journey again, and we're going to increase this transform a little bit like that. And now if we look at this, you can see each stroke is now growing from the point of its origin, just adding a little bit more variety and complexity. Now to set up the next node on this list, uh, I want to stay in the same comp and kind of build this out because we are in 3D after all. So why don't we go ahead and do something with the perspective and I'm going to show you how we can use this next tool to make our life a lot easier. So if I go ahead and view this text 3D over here in the left viewer, if I hold Alt or Option on a Mac and my middle mouse button, I can kind of orbit around like this. You can also hold the middle mouse and use your regular left click and drag left and right to zoom in. Now what I'm going to do is kind of frame up maybe on this letter M right here and get pretty close to it like this. And here's a fun little trick. If you actually grab the camera from your toolbar and throw it into the 3D viewer, this will create a merge with a camera that has these position coordinates already copied inside of the transform settings. Now, if I play this back through, it might not look off right now, but if you kind of move the camera around, you'll start to see that there's a problem with the rays. They're kind of always facing the camera because this is a 2D effect and it has no idea what kind of 3D coordinates we're working with over here. Really, if we use the center controls, this should look something more like this. 
But if we added any animation to our camera that would change the perspective of our text here, we'd have to also keyframe the center controls for the rays. But there's actually a much easier way so you don't have to manually do this. But before I show you, let's go ahead and create a simple camera animation. Now one other trick here, you can see if I zoom in too closely, you can see it starts to cut off these letters. So in my camera under the control settings, you can drop the near a little bit. Usually what I do is just type in zero. It won't actually let you go all the way to zero, but it'll default to 0 0.05 and that will fix that kind of clipping issue. This is just happening because we're too close to the text there. So I'm gonna go ahead and frame my camera up about like this. And let's go to the very beginning of the timeline and go to our transform tab again. And I'm gonna add some animation for the X, Y, and Z translation, as well as the rotation sliders. And I might as well also add a little bit of this Z rotation. Okay, something like that. Let's go towards the end of our comp and let's just reset most of these sliders back to zero. Maybe for the Z offset, we'll do something like two. And I'm just gonna open up the spline editor quickly and hit F to flatten these animations a little bit. And I'm gonna isolate just those rotation keyframes a little. And if you hit T on the keyboard, you get your ease in controls. And I'm just gonna grab my rotation and create a little bit of a tighter animation, a bit like this. So now we've got this camera movement. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is click on my Merge 3D and bring in the Locator 3D node. And let's go ahead and view this. Now down here in the corner, I'm just gonna right click and change this back to the default perspective. That way when I move around like this, I'm not gonna mess with my camera. So what the Locator 3D really does is it just gives you this little control point that you can later connect to any 2D element to. So for example, if I position this behind the text like this, now I can go over to my rays and right click center and connect to the locator position. And so now you can see as the camera pans around, the rays are more accurately shining forward. In fact, if I go into my camera and I'm just gonna create a different version so I don't mess up my keyframes here, but you can see here, if I just kind of pan around with the camera, the rays are actually shining forward, but without that locator, again, if I just double click to reset, you can see now as I pan around, those rays are always facing the camera because it's just a 2D effect. So the locator 3D node makes this a lot easier. Again, you just put this inside of your 3D node system. Usually this is gonna go right before your final render node because it is a 3D node. And then in your 2D node, you're just gonna right click any kind of center control and connect it to that locator position. And there you go. So you can see if I move this camera anywhere, those rays are always casting in the correct direction. And you'll notice the locator also has this target input. This is optional, but it works really well when you pair it with something like a spotlight or any other kind of light. So let me just grab a spotlight and connect it into my merge. And I'm gonna go to the transform over here and toggle on use target. And I'm just gonna push this further back and up like this, and maybe even widen out the cone angle like that. We can't see any lighting at the moment, so I have to go to my render node 3D and enable the lighting and shadows. Everything goes black because we're only lighting up the back of the text. So I'll just add another point light here and just connect that straight into the merge. Maybe we'll just push this a little bit in front and up above something like that. As our text plays through, you can see we now have a little bit more of a realistic lighting being shined on the front face of the text. Now we still have this locator over here and it's really convenient when you do have a spotlight like this because you can just point this directly into the target input. Now you'll notice I already moved this a little bit so as soon as this accepts a target these become the offset. So what you would probably want to do is reset these if you want the locator to live exactly where this spotlight is. So now with all of this set up you can see if I move my spotlight it moves the rays and the realistic lighting that's actually in the 3D scene. You can't really see this because our text is pretty flat. So if I go to my text 3D, go back over here to the extrusion settings, I'm just gonna increase this extrusion just a bit like that. And now as I move this spotlight around, it's changing the lighting around the text as well as the rays. So the locator node is just one of those super simple and slick solutions to connecting the 2D world with your 3D environment. So uh, I just can't help myself. Let's continue with the same comp. I'm gonna add a little bit more things to it to set up a scenario for the third node on the list.
All right, so let's go ahead and add a background because right now it's just kind of a black background. And one of my favorite ways to add a background, especially with 3D titles like this, is to use a shape. Let's go ahead and connect this into the Merge 3D. And I'm just gonna move this a little bit further back in the Z space. Let's go ahead and increase the scale. And let's change the color to like a dark red. I think that will complement the rest of the colors that we have in here. And I'm gonna add a Bender 3D and just increase this amount, kind of create like this psych wall kind of thing. We can also use the center to angle this up. If we zoom out, you can see what we're doing a little bit better. You can kind of angle this, kind of like that, and then I'm gonna go back to my shape, maybe just move it down a bit on the Y axis. And if you go to the beginning, uh, you can see this is still like pretty bright. So in my shape, I might go down to the material settings under the specular, and let's just kind of reduce the intensity a bit. So we're still getting this nice kind of hot spot in the middle because we're using the bender node to create kind of like this vertical streak rather than the default circular streak that the point light will create. Now, one thing that you will often run into whenever you have some kind of smooth gradient like this, let me zoom in here so you can see this a bit better. You can see there's like these bands that happen and the best way to fix this is with grain, but the default grain node is actually kind of heavy and I don't typically resort to this when I need grain. So instead, what I like to do is add the filter node. So I'm gonna slide down here and at the very end here, I'm just gonna select the last merge there and add the filter. And the filter has a few different types. I'm just gonna switch this to grain. And you can see that takes care of the banding quite nicely. So if we disable it, there's our stripes again and we turn this on and it just smooths everything out, makes it look that much better. So I love the filter node, it's super fast. It doesn't really add any render time. It's a very lightweight node and it can do all kinds of things. In this case, we're just using it to add grain to the overall effect here, resulting in a nice clean image. But let me show you a couple other ways you can use the filter node. Okay, so let's take a look at this shot here. Now let's say I wanted to add some realistic light rays over the mountains. So if I select my media in and simply just add the rays effect, you can see that it really just attacks the luminance of the image. It has no idea that there's an edge here and realistically, that's kind of where the light rays would shine right over. So right before the rays node, what I could do is add the filter node. So the default relief option is similar to a create bump map and uh, kind of creates like this indention effect here. Emboss over is similar, except it retains the RGB values. So for this example, what I actually want to choose is this Sobel filter. So this is kind of like the edge detection. So if we view this right here, let's open up a second viewer, pull up the edge detect. Let's connect this to edge detect and pull them up side by side. And you can see they're very similar, but they're a little bit different. And the main difference between the edge detect and the Sobel filter is the edge detect will only detect RGB values. So for example, if I had a logo like this and I ran this through the edge detect, it doesn't know that there's a difference between these pixels and these pixels because according to their RGB values, there isn't. These are 000, zero, zero and so is this alpha channel. But if we connected this to the filter node and toggle on the alpha, you can see now it actually recognizes there's a difference between these pixels. So it's a little different from the edge detect and it's also simpler. There's less settings that you have to tweak most of the time. So let's actually go into our rays and disable the merge over. This will just give us the rays isolated like this. And we can separately merge this over our original footage, reconnect this to media out. This gives us a little bit more control over those rays. And you can see that we're also getting these rays on parts of the image that we don't really want. So what we could do is add a matte control just before the filter. The matte control is kind of like a mask that you can apply downstream instead of applying it here, which would impact the entire node tree. So what I'll do is just take an ellipse. And if I grab this with my right click, I can drop this into the garbage matte input. And I'll take this ellipse and just make a really huge mask that kind of covers the bottom half of the frame a bit like this. In fact, this will probably be easier if I just look at the filter node. Now you can see that it's also detecting the edge of our ellipse. So I can fix that just by increasing the soft edge. And we also have an edge around the frame. So I could also add a rectangle mask after my ellipse. And let's just stretch the height and the width all the way up and invert it and maybe reduce the border width and soften that out. So let's take a look at our media out once again. 
And now we can kind of tweak the settings of our rays. Maybe move this over to where the sun probably would be in this frame. And I can go to my merge node and maybe set this to screen and reduce the blend just a little bit. So this looks pretty good. Now it looks a little bit sharp. So we could also use another filter after the rays. And this time I can set this to defocus. And the unique thing about this defocus compared to like a regular blur is it kind of retains a lot of the streaks, which is kind of nice in this example because I want there to be streaks that you can actually see, but I just wanted to kind of soften the overall effect a little bit. I'm sure you've used this next node before, but I want to share a different way of thinking about what it really does so that you can use it creatively. This is the brightness contrast. So the brightness contrast is a pretty self-explanatory node. You've got some gain control, gamma, saturation, and down here you can adjust the low black point and the white point. But what's unique about the brightness contrast node is it can also affect your alpha channel. And where this gets interesting is when you have some kind of halfway transparent color. So just as an example, let me go ahead and add a directional blur right after my text here. And I'm just gonna increase the length of this you can notice right here, we've got these alpha values that are in between 0 and 1. So I'll just give this kind of an angle like this. Now, if I go to my brightness contrast and enable the alpha channel, if I drop the high threshold here, you can see that all those transparent values get crushed. And now if I hover over, we're getting these values that are pretty extreme and you never want to have, you really don't want to have any RGB values above one, but you definitely don't want to have any alpha values below zero or above one. So one of the utilities with the brightness contrast is these clip toggles. So you can simply just turn on the clip black and clip white and now all of your channels will live between zero and one. So already this is kind of just a useful node to attach at the end of a graphic, for example, to ensure that you're not gonna have any weird compositing errors. But anyway, let me go ahead and just keep on increasing this. So now we've got this giant block of the shape that our directional blur is creating, right? So I can grab a background node and feed the output of my brightness contrast into the blue mask input just to give us a silhouette and let's go ahead and give this maybe like a nice purple like this. And if I disconnect my brightness contrast from my media out and actually just take my text and merge it over that background node and then reconnect this. Now you can see we've got this pretty simple long shadow effect. And you can always type in or hit the arrow keys to increase that length beyond 0.1. And this is another kind of thing that you see everywhere in motion graphics. And this is a really simple way to do this again, thanks to that brightness contrast node. And another thing that you can do here using the filter node again is kind of create a little bit of depth. So let me add a filter node right here in empty space. And I'm going to feed this the output from my directional blur. And then I'll just take the output of that and then re-merge this back over my background. And in this filter node, we can set this to Sobel. And immediately you can see that there's kind of like this artificial 3D depth effect on our directional blur. If we change that angle, you can kind of see that it looks like it's 3D. There's some lighting going on. So it's kind of like a cheap, fast way to emulate this nice flashy 3D text effect without having to actually do anything in 3D space. And I can go back to this background node because this is what's giving me the bevel color. And I can kind of mess around with these values to get different color schemes. So lots of stuff you can do with a brightness contrast just by simply clamping your alpha values to get you something like this. So let me show you another example here. So I just got a very simple title and I went ahead and keyframed the size in the tracking to give me this kind of animation where it's sort of ballooning up and growing like this. Now, similar to the directional blur, if I just use a regular blur and increase that blur size, this is another way that we can get these halfway transparent values around the edge. So if you actually view the blur, you can see right there, there's some alpha values in between zero and one. And let's add another brightness contrast right after that blur. And let's view the brightness contrast. And same thing with this, I'm gonna turn on the alpha channel. And if you actually hold control or command, you can grab these high or low sliders and kind of cinch both of them together symmetrically like this. So it's a little bit faster. And I don't wanna to go too far because we might get this jagged edge. In fact, if we go all the way, it will just completely disappear. So I wanna have a little bit of room for this to breathe. Now, let's say I wanted to add some color to this text. If I went back to my text node and tried to do it this way, 
Uh, you can see we have kind of this undesirable effect. That's because we're pushing the contrast so heavily in this brightness contrast. So to add some color, I could just use a background and feed the brightness contrast into the mask of my background. And then we'll feed this into the merge. And we can use this background to give it any kind of color we want. I'm going to choose kind of like a bright red. Actually, I'm going to go down to this merge node and change the apply mode to screen. That way it'll take a little bit of influence from this background color we've got here. So it's going to give us this kind of purple and pink color combination. And now if I go back to this blur over here, you can see if I increase the blur, we almost get this like liquidy melting text effect. And if we scrub through this animation, you can see how the letters are almost like sticking to each other. Let's push this a little bit further and I'm just going to add a filter node after the background. And in this filter node, I'm going to set the filter type to emboss and let's just crank up that power to about seven. Now, if I zoom in here, you can see there's some transparency around the edge. I can fix this just by disabling the alpha channel. And now we've got these cool highlights, but we also have a really crunchy drop shadow. I'm not a huge fan of that. So what we'll do is add another set of blurs and brightness contrast nodes together. So I'm going to use this blur and just kind of do something like this. And let's get another brightness contrast after that blur. And in the second brightness contrast, we're going to turn on the alpha once again, clip the black and whites. Now I can use this brightness contrast to add more contrast to that bubbly highlight effect. And I can come back to this blur and kind of mess around with this emboss because right out of the box, the emboss will give you a really sharp highlight. So we're just using this blur to kind of soften that out. And then we're using this brightness contrast to sort of resharpen it back. So we can kind of use both of these nodes together to really control those highlights. So if we zoom out here a little bit, you can see we get these really cool, almost like cartoony highlights. We can go back to the filter and even adjust the angle if we want to. Now let's also keyframe this very first blur because remember if we adjust this, you can get this like blobby melty effect. Let's click on the text and find our last keyframe, which is on frame 100. I'm just going to go a little bit forward in time and go into my blur node and let's reduce this. I don't want to go all the way because it's going to look a little bit too sharp. And I kind of want there to be a little bit of this stickiness in between some of the letters. So for me, about six seems like a good value. And I'm just going to add a keyframe on that blur size. And now we'll go to the very beginning and we'll just increase that blur up to around maybe 30. And maybe we'll open up the spline editor and just grab our blur animation. And I'm just going to select both of those handles and hit F. Just kind of create a little bit more of this easing on that animation. And now if we play this through, we get this really nice liquid melting kind of ballooning effect on our text. And this is all possible with these blurs and brightness contrast together. So without those, this is what just the blur looks like. Of course, we do have a filter node in there as well. And we're just kind of clamping all those values to really control the edges of the blur as well as the edges of our filter. OK, so the last node on this list is probably my favorite just because it solves so many problems and I don't see enough people talking about it. So before I reveal what it is, let me go ahead and set up a couple situations where this node really comes to the rescue. So let's say we want to replace the screen on this TV over here. Now, I've already used the planar tracker to track out this plane over here. And in my planar tracker, I could set the operation mode to corner pin. And this gives me these on-screen controls, which I can match up to the corners of the TV. And now with my corners pinned to the corners of the TV, I can send some replacement footage directly into the corner pin input. But notice what happens to our footage. It gets kind of squished like this. This is happening because this footage, if we view this over here in the left viewer, it's originally vertical. So it's 2160 by 4096. And the corner pin operation is simply just going to squish the image to fit inside of this box. To fix this, there's a few different ways to do it. One of the common ways that you're probably thinking of already is uh, if you use a background node and you merge the footage over the background, this will correctly map the footage to this new aspect ratio. And then you can send this merge into the corner pin and it doesn't look squished. But now, of course, we'd have to go into the merge and do a little bit of resizing. And we kind of have to do this by eye or, you know, we could probably use an expression or type in some math here. And then we can also use the center control to offset the position. And we can actually go too far and you'll start to see some black. Now, this is a totally fine method. This does work. 
but there is a much easier way to do this. So we're going to get rid of all of these nodes and reconnect our media into the corner pin. Now we have our squished image again. Now here's the secret node. Ready? It's called letterbox. So the letterbox node basically does what we just did over here with these two nodes, except it does everything automatically. We don't have to scale our image and we have this center control where we could offset the position. And what's nice about this is it won't let you go too far. So you can see if I keep going down, once it meets the last pixel in this original frame, we can't go further. So we'll never have to worry about, you know, getting down to the very, very bottom of this original media if we wanted to. Same with the size. This is automatically fixed the left and right side to fit into the comp that we're placing on our TV. So the letterbox node kind of combines the functionality of the resize node and the crop node all together with a little bit of extra smart stuff going on under the hood. So I use this all the time. It's really useful whenever you're comping together multiple kinds of media that have different aspect ratios, different resolutions, and you want to normalize everything so it's a lot easier to work with. And it's a much cleaner design rather than merging over a background. Plus, if you're working with a logo, you don't have to remember to lower the alpha of your background because the letterbox node doesn't have any replacement color. It's just going to give you what you're throwing into it. All right, so take a look at this other example. Let's say I wanted to replace the sky with a different image. So I'm going to do this pretty quickly just by using the magic mask. So it's probably not going to look perfect, but it should be good enough just for this demonstration. OK, so you can see here I've gotten rid of the sky. And if I open up my media pool, uh, maybe this sky down here. Now, if I merge this over my sky, look what happens. Everything gets all crazy because we've got this giant resolution because that's what the resolution is of our sky. And anytime you use a merge node, the output of that merge takes the resolution from the background input. Of course, with this, you could also take this, merge it over your background and then reconnect this to the background. But you can see here, we've got all this extra room and maybe we want this, maybe that's fine. But if we wanted to be sure that we're using the entire image, we'd have to be really tedious and scale this down or do again, we have to do some math or some expression to make sure that we're meeting the very edge of the frame there. Once again, if I add a letterbox right after this media, it does everything for me. One node, super clean, super easy solution and I don't have to tediously scale something and make sure it fits. And again, I've got my center control so I can just move this around, kind of find the area of the sky that looks right. So let me show you one last example. So here you can see I'm actually in a vertical timeline. And if I open up the Fusion page, you can see that we're still working with the original aspect ratio of this media, which is great. That's kind of the nice thing about Fusion is that you always have access to every single pixel in your original media even though in our timeline, we're cropping this for delivery because we're delivering this out to a vertical timeline. So over here on the Fusion page, let's say we just wanted to add a very simple title. And let's say we want like this giant, huge, blocky title, something like this, right? Now, if we go over here to the edit page, our title is getting cut off because when we're working over here in Fusion, we can't really see what the final delivery is like. So of course, one idea is if you copy your text and actually make this into a compound clip and then take this into Fusion. Now you're actually working with that new compound clip, which is cut into vertical. And so this would be a lot easier to, you know, take your text, merge it over and fit everything together in your vertical comp. The downside is we've lost the left and right side of this image. So if we wanted to adjust it, we would have to annoyingly open this up in its timeline and make our adjustments and we're kind of hopping around all over the place and it's not the most efficient workflow. So again, I'm going to decompose and now we're back to our original widescreen image. So once again, we're going to use the letterbox, but this time we're using it at the very end of our node tree. And over here, we can simply type in the resolution that we're finally delivering to. So 1080 by 1920. And at default settings, you can see that we've got all this extra room because our mode is set to letterbox envelope which basically means if you've got a widescreen image and you're conforming it into vertical, it's going to meet the left and right side while creating all this dead space on the top and bottom. Pan and scan will do the opposite. This will crop in so that the top and bottom meet the top and bottom of your comp size while getting rid of the left and right side. 
And so the benefit with this is we can work with our native resolution of our media while we're looking at the final aspect ratio that we're gonna deliver to without having to hop around to different pages and kind of doing a bunch of guesswork to make sure that things are gonna look okay and not get cut off. So that is the magical letterbox node. <laughs> and that's all the nodes I have to share with you today. I know this is a bit of a longer video, so thank you so much for watching to the end if you made it this far. And hopefully you felt inspired and learned some new tricks. Now the announcement that I wanted to make, we are planning a lot more Fusion tutorials, but we wanna know what you wanna see covered. Uh, even if it's not Fusion related, that's totally fine, but leave a comment down below of a specific title or effect, or even just like a vague area within Fusion that you feel isn't covered enough. And we will take in those comments and try our very best to deliver what you're asking for. So again, thank you so much for checking this video out. The more attention we get, the more engagement we get with things like this, the more we're gonna produce for you guys. So that's all I have to say. My name is Matt McCool. I will see you in the next one.